Hi, Leah Jorgensen here in Portland, Oregon, my home office, um, talking about some interesting things regarding geology from Southern Oregon, where I get the majority of my grapes for my Cabernet Franc based and inspired wines. Um, today I want to talk about Crater View Ranch. Crater View Ranch is the largest and most diverse vineyard farmed by Quail Run Vineyards. I buy most of my fruit from Quail Run Vineyards in the Rogue Valley. Um, it's a 30-year-old family business nestled in the picturesque Rogue Valley. And Crater View is the farthest northwestern vineyard planted and farmed um, by Quail Run. And it's got a western, sort of southern and eastern aspect situated just outside of the charming and popular wine country destination Jacksonville. Jacksonville is an old gold mining town with lots of rich and wild history. It's a beautiful place to visit. Um, but I have a little, I have a lot of props today, so I'm going to do my best to give a little storytelling here. But this is the Rogue Valley. And these are some of the vineyards planted by Quail Run Vineyards. And this one right up here, that's Quail, I'm sorry, that's Crater View Vineyard. And there's a photo of what the topography with the landscape looks like. So, this is very south, not too far from the California border. Um, 320 acres are planted to a wide variety of grapes and clones, um, including Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the blocks that I use for some of my wines and my winemaking programs. So the Sauvignon Blanc is a Crater View Vineyard single vineyard wine. Um, my Malbec is a Crater View Vineyard or Crater View Ranch single vineyard wine. And then my Cabernet Franc Southern Oregon um, is a composite of a little bit of a maize vineyard in the Applegate Valley, a little bit of Sundown Vineyard in the Rogue Valley, and a little bit of Crater Lake uh, Vineyard or Ranch in Southern Oregon. So this is a Southern Oregon designation. So I have three wines that I make where uh, Crater View Vineyard fruit, Crater View Ranch, I always call it vineyard, they, they call it ranch down there. Um, but I have three wines that I make that are... Um, produced with using some of the fruit from this particular site. And um, currently there are 70 more acres under development at Crater View Ranch. The elevation starts from 1500 to about 1670 feet. Um, the, so the soil series is very diverse and depending on what field um, the fruit is coming from, there are different um, comprised series of soils available. Mostly it's what's called silty loam or silty um, clay, um, other loam, uh, there's other series of roan, loan, I'm sorry I can't talk, loam. Um, uh, like they're like clayish, dusty soils. And in the summer of 2015, this is where it starts to get interesting. Um, I was doing my routine walk around in the vineyard and um, the owner, or I'm sorry, the manager of Quail Run, well, he's the co-owner and manager of Quail Run Vineyards. His parents founded Quail Run Vineyards. Uh, Michael Moore showed me this 10 foot high rock pile in the middle or on the outside of uh, where they were planting some new vines or clearing out quite a bit of, of land. And, um, you know, I was joking around with him like, hey, what an eyesore, can't you clean up your vineyard? But really, they were in the process of doing some really important work. And Michael said, I'll tell you what, you're, you're a geek. I know you're going to, that's a compliment. He's like, you're going to appreciate this. Um, head on over to that pile of rock and tell me what you see. So, I did, and um, as soon as I approached the rocks, I looked down and I pulled out my phone and I took some photos and I'm gonna show you right away what I saw. So I'm picking up the camera here. The first thing I saw was this lovely thing right here. Where is it? This right here? Hold on. There, 
Okay, so this is a giant, I'm not a good camera woman, so bear with me. I'm showing you nothing, nothing. See that? Okay, this is an ancient marine fossil. It's spiny, it's either some kind of fish. This is not to scale, this is a giant um, blown up image from a photo I took with my phone. Okay, so that was the first thing I saw and I was like, that's crazy. Um, but it was very cool and I, I knew what was ahead. So I looked a little bit further and this is what I saw next. Again, taken from my camera, blown up. It's hard to see here, but if you look around, there are, where's my hand? Here we go. There are shell imprints all along here. Shell imprints. Ancient marine shell imprints, okay? If that's not cool enough, there was one more thing I saw as I was running around looking at this giant pile of rocks. This. Ancient mollusk shells, okay? Check it out. Ancient mollusk shells in the vineyard. Look at that, right there. Ancient mollusk shell. This is fancy film work here, so, you know, watch out, Hollywood. <clears throat> PBS. Anyways, um, why is that important? <laughs> what is all of this? What does that mean? Um, I'll tell you. The state geologist, one of the state geologists, Scott Burns, had a, a conversation with Michael Moore, and he's a professor at Portland State University. And he confirmed that these ancient marine fossils are about 250 million years old, which are associated with subduction zones where orogenic belts and metamorphic rock were formed as part of the tectonic process of subduction with two scenarios, okay? So that's where either a continent rides forcefully over an ocean plate or where there's converg convergence of two or more continents creating a collision. In the case of the Pacific Northwest, where we are situated, uh, and what we're looking at here is the first scenario involving the Cascadian fault line and uh, two plates met, the Juan de Fuca. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm often not doing my research and pronouncing things. I get creative. Anyways, the Juan de Fuca and the North American, and with it came a massive tsunami and earthquake. So cool. Not cool then, so cool now. Because, does this sound familiar by the way? The recent news media uh, has warned us of predictions for pending and perhaps overdue occurrence of this catas um, the catacly I can't talk, Catacly <laughs> cataclysmic, uh, movement of these two plates along the Cascadian subduction zone. So this is supposed to happen sometime within the next 50 years or so. Expecting a resulting earthquake along the entire Pacific Northwest, estimating a devastating 8 to 9 point Richter scale earthquake. Scary. <sighs> but on a more celebratory note, these rocks, and look at this. I've got samples that I pulled from the vineyard. This here, these rocks are called blue schist rock. I love how marbleized they look. They're a beautiful blue gray. My lighting in my office is never quite right. But these rocks are 250 million years old. These were on the bottom of the ocean, of the Pacific Ocean, and got thrusted out, tear, tore their way through the valley that is now the Rogue Valley. Some of this material going as far as the Cascade Mountain Range. We're talking a total alleyway of oceanic, ocean bottom material that is the land, the landscape, really, of the Rogue Valley. Check it out, 250 million year old rock. So what does that mean? Well, these rocks are originally from the ocean bottom and the soils in this vineyard predate many of the soil series that we talk about and gush over in the old world, particularly France, 
in my case, I talk about the Loire Valley a lot. And the series, the geological series that created the calcified um, limestone and the ocean bottom um, rock and also, not ocean bottom, but it is, they were seabeds, not quite ocean, but um, but basically Paris was under, or right, the, the area around Paris was, um, was a, a pool basically, a huge um, body of water, which is now the Loire Valley vineyards. And of course there are shellfish there as well. We can talk about that in Chablis. Oregon is not France, but what I'm saying is that the series that we look at, that we're looking at that created these very dramatic um, upheaval of ocean bottom floor into what is now the Rogue Valley, what we know is it happened 250 million years ago, and that predates the episodes that we talk about in the old world in France by a hundred million years. Okay, we're talking the time of the dinosaurs. This gave us rich calciferous soil series, which tell an incredible story about Southern Oregon's geology and viticulture. And Craterview Ranch is the perfect place to begin this exciting conversation. Because up until now, the only conversations people really have been having about Southern Oregon soils are about the loam and the silty um, range of, of dirt. So yes, clay, we know clay can be ocean bottom material, but now this is evidence and conversation about something that's so cool. So that's about the shell, the ocean bottom, the blue schist rock that came from the bottom and all these fossils of, of little ancient marine creatures that are um, fossilized and imprinted in this particular site. So if it's in the Craterview Ranch, we know it's other places as well. The other thing I want to talk about is what happened when Oregon became a state. So in the pursuit of natural resources, every state would have their Department of Agriculture go out and survey land for things to mine, trees, you name it. Things that can be part of the state's natural resources and value. Places where they can employ people to work. So we're talking about creating labor, creating jobs, creating um, money for the state. And so as far as I believe, and I'm looking at my notes here because I am putting all this material together. I am potentially putting a book out about these discoveries because it's really exciting. Um, but I believe this went back. Oregon State Board of Agriculture um, started investigating this in 1898 where they were doing an analysis of, in particular, Rock Point Limestone uh, in Jackson County. So I'll back up a little bit. But basically, um, a little bit later, in 1939, there was um, a survey of Pikes Peak. And there were limestone deposits situated in Jackson County, Oregon. And in the Foots Creek Mining District, which is approximately one and a quarter miles from the Pacific Highway and approximately three and a half miles um, from the town of Rogue River, um, there, there were these deposits um, that the state was surveying and checking out and evaluating and analyzing for look for limestone. So Jackson County records of mining and in Medford show limestone was first located in the summer of 1929. So part of that then created um, there. There's a d different um, different chemical and physical laboratories in the state were doing further analysis. And in August 1937, a fellow named um, E.W. Lazel, he was a PhD, um, he examined on November, well, he was talking about in November 1920, he examined lime, the limestone deposit from Pikes Peak in the Foot Creek Mining District near Gold Hill. And the limestone deposit was what he said and quote extensive there's sufficient limestone exposed to warrant development 
The analysis given um, showed from a composite sample represented the largest body of limestone exposed. And in it, there was silica, there was alumina and iron oxide. But most importantly, there was 54.78% lime. Um, and in general, he was looking at the calcium carbonate calculation um, of the material of the different minerals that were in this particular um, composite sample, calculating at 97.82% calcium carbonate. So when the Department of Agriculture is looking at sites to evaluate the, the value of limestone, there's really two kinds of grades, a high grade, low grade. Um, there are other parts in the state that had some low grade limestone, including a few pockets in the Willamette Valley. They were nothing to write about. They weren't important. They didn't even um, contain enough lime percentage silica and especially the calcium carbonate composition to make it worth any time. So if you say there was some limestone in Willamette Valley, it doesn't really matter. But in Southern Oregon, in the Rogue Valley, they found a ton of it. Like a, they, basically, um, there was a limestone band that cut through part of Southern Oregon. Um, the Oregon Caves on the Oregon coast. Um, well, there's the Oregon Caves in the Medford area. And there are limestone caves near Wilderville, um, which is near Rock Quarry. And there are folds of limestone um, cascading from about 35 foot elevation or 35, 35 foot ceiling in some of these caves. Um, there are about a dozen or so limestone caves in Josephine and Jackson counties. And then, of course, like I said, the uh, Gold Beach, the Oregon coast, where all the um, where people go to see the sea lions all limestone. So there's evidence of a ton of limestone that has been in this area. Um, and the analysis of this limestone is that it is a good source and worthy to warrant development. So I want to just show a couple documents. Um, this is the original report from E.L. Um, Laszlo, Ph.D. in 1937. That's the year my dad was born. Um, he was in my dad grew up in Eugene, Oregon. So way south here uh, in southern Oregon. This is the original documentation I found through the Historical Society. Um, this is super cool. Look at these hand-drawn renderings. This is a sketch of Pikes Peak limestone deposits in Jackson County. This is from, I believe, 19, 1830. I can't read that. I'm sorry, 1880. This is from 1880. Okay, that's nuts. Um... So this is Jackson County limestone analysis. And then here, this is a limestone quarry showing elevation. This shows rock concealed. It shows where the quarry is down here and um, where rock is concealed. And this was November 19, I think this was 1927 when this was rendered. Crazy, I love it. This stuff drives me nuts, it's so exciting. I want to get in there and do more research, and it's something that I am working on. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a lot more to learn about what we're finding in the soils, and it's exciting for me making wines of Cab Franc, Cote-style Malbec, and Sauvignon Blanc, okay? Um, if we believe in terroir, if we want to talk about terroir, we talk about minerality, we talk about the calcium carbonate and all the minerals that are rich in these soils because of ocean bottom uh, material, that's crazy exciting. At least to me it is. So stay tuned. I'm going to be synthesizing this material and putting it in a, in a more user-friendly um, method to learn about uh, what what's happening down south. I, again, am not a geologist. I'm just doing my own research based on what is available um, through the state of Oregon's Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm going to consult more with Scott Burns and see if I can learn a few more things from him. Um, but this is an exciting time for Southern Oregon to celebrate the wines that 
that are coming from that region. And it explains why there's so much diversity and ability to grow so many different varietals. So that's my that's my evening um, report tonight. No wines getting poured and swirled around and slurped in front of you tonight. Just some geology to nerd out on, geek out on a little bit. So thanks for chiming in. And... Um, you know, please make comments by chiming in. Please make some comments, ask some questions if you will. And, um, and thanks for checking in. Take care.